Hey everybody, this is episode number 13 of Patterson in Pursuit, and today we are diving into economics, specifically the foundations of economics, really the epistemology of economics. So I wasn't always interested in philosophy proper. I got kind of sucked into politics around 2006, 2007. Shortly after that, I got sucked into economics. And I just dove into economics, and I, I love the field. And I, I think economics is one of those areas of thought which you really can't overlook if you want to try to understand how the world works. But economics then sucked me into philosophy. So I only got to philosophy, which is really my primary love, through economics. And there's a very specific reason why. In the world of economics, just like any other field of thought, there are lots of different schools of thought. There's different mutually exclusive theories. One of these theories is called the Austrian School of Economics, and it's unique on a number of different levels. And one of the unique features of the Austrian School of Economics is the methodological claims or the epistemological claims about economic propositions. So you might ask, what is the status of economic propositions or economic theory or economic law? What is the status in the sense that are they empirical hypotheses or, or are they logically necessary truths? And one strain in the Austrian school says they're actually logically necessary truths, that economic theory is a purely deductive exercise. Now, that doesn't mean all of economics is purely deductive, but it means the, the bones, as you'll hear in this interview, the bones of economics is purely logically deductive. Now, if you're not familiar with this school, that probably strikes you as a very remarkable proposition, and indeed it is. So my guest today is Dr. Pete Betke, who is an Austrian school economist. He teaches at George Mason University in Virginia, and I've known Pete for several years, and I think we have kind of a cool relationship because he is one of the economists who has, I think, the correct economic methodology, and he's written... Uh, several books, one of which, uh, his most recent book, is absolutely fantastic. It's called Living Economics, and I'll have a link to it in today's show notes page, steve-patterson.com slash 13. Definitely pick up a copy of that book. So on the one hand, we're very much uh, close to full agreement in terms of um, the basics of economics. But on the other hand, Pete and I very strongly disagree about academia. It's not something we really talk about in this interview, but we've had lots of conversations. He's a, a big name in academia, and he has a lot of sway, and he wants you know young people who are interested in the world of ideas to try to sway others by going through the established uh, academic system. And if, obviously, uh, if you've been following this podcast at all, you know I'm about as far away from that position as possible. But I still, e even that being the case, I have a massive amount of respect for Pete, specifically because he has consistently demonstrated that he is a clear and critical thinker, even though, yes, he is in academia. So if you're not familiar with Austrian economics or economics in general, this conversation might be a bit intense or, or too deep or boring. Um, but if you're an economic nerd or if you're interested in the topic, I think you're going to get a lot out of talking about the epistemological nature of economic theory. So like I said earlier, Pete is a university professor of economics and philosophy at George Mason University. He is the BB&T professor for the study of capitalism and the director of the F.A. Hyatt Program for Advanced Study in Philosophy, Politics, and Economics. I hope you enjoy our conversation. So first of all, Dr. Pete Becky, thank you very much for taking the time to speak with me today. Oh, it's great to be here with you. Uh, I have a few questions for you that I'm super excited about. Uh, one of the reasons I wanted to talk to you in particular is because you have a fairly unique position on economic methodology. Uh -huh. You take, uh, if I may label it this, you take a Misesian approach to economics. And I was, I was wondering if you could maybe explain what is unique about your approach or the Misesian tradition in economics, maybe versus other um, methodology, methodologies yeah. in economics? Well, I think, you know, there's different ways to slice that. I mean, there's certain core ideas in economics coming from Adam Smith all the way forward in the classicals to the early neoclassicals to modern developments in economics. And, um, and so, you know, depending on, on how you take epistemological ideas about where how, how do we understand how we got this knowledge how do we justify it 
Um, and then I think you can divide that into very broad brushes between deductive and empirical uh, approaches. So inductive versus deductive. And I'm on the, de the deductive side, and I believe that we need to have our theories are, in fact, prior to our interpretation of the facts. And so, therefore, you know, facts are never these brute things that then we clash our theories against and either reject or fail to reject our theories. What we have is our theories are prior, and the fact theories are like a set of eyeglasses, and we put them on, and that enable us to read. And that, that means that we read and understand and interpret the facts that are out there in the world. And what happens is the test of our theories is, one, the internal logic of the theory itself, and then two, the applicability of a theory to a particular set of circumstances to help us better understand those circumstances. And so we can, we don't reject theories. Like it's not like say the Austrian business cycle theory is ever wrong based on the facts or the Austrian argument about socialism is ever wrong based on the facts. Um, the theory is wrong whether or not you've proved that the logical chain of reasoning is wrong, mm -hmm. right? But it could be the case that a country could call itself socialist, not really be socialist, right? And, and be running around and doing things. And then people say, oh, see, but Sweden isn't collapsing due to the economic calculation. And it's like, well, but Sweden's really not socialist as according to the theory of socialism. That is, they haven't abolished private property and the means of production um, and all that entails. And so in that regard, I think that the Mises' position is the position that I hold, which is that all the good classical economists were, at the end of the day, a prioris. Mm -hmm right, and early neoclassical economists. It's really in the 20th century after the rise of positivist philosophy and a, ver a, ver a version of formalism uh, that we ended up by getting this kind of weird way we do economics now, which is that you build models and then you run them uh, you know, against the data and then you reject or fail to reject your theories and you think that's science. Right. I don't think that's at all how we do science and it gets very complicated and then, of course, there's nuances within the different positions. I don't want to say that everyone was a Misesian who was on the good side of things, <laughs> you know, but in some broad sense they were, and then it becomes very narrow differences. But let me give one other example, which is right up your, your field of philosophy, which is I think one way to think about what went wrong with economics is that um, the um, principles of critical reasoning are what govern philosophical discourse for centuries, okay? And we made a very important distinction in philosophical discourse between sound reasoning and valid reasoning, all right? And so what sound reasoning was is that if the premises are true, the conclusions are true if you engage in the sound reasoning. What valid reasoning is is it doesn't matter whether or not the premises are true, but you follow the arguments and there's no logical leaps or whatever. And what older economists, classical economists and early neoclassical economists all the way up to Mises were concerned with was the idea that you could generate sound reasoning within economics, right? Um, and uh, this is why the arguments were that the a priori theorizing of Mises was not just merely a tautology, right? It actually was... Uh, kind of these statements that had empirical significance because the prem if the premises are true, like say, for example, the action axiom and the logical chain of the reasoning is correct, then the conclusions are going to be, in fact, true about the world, not just about the model. Right. Well, it's really, really hard to do that. Right. It's 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 it, people make mistakes all the time. And so in the 20th century, what happened was at the same time that we were developing statistical you know, models of statistical significance and uh, techniques to drive statistical significance. There also was a move to try to say, look, the greatest ambiguity in reasoning comes from using the same words to mean different things or different words to mean the same thing. So we can't do that with mathematics. So what we're going to do is we're going to translate all of our theorizing into mathematics because it makes us state our assumptions explicitly. And our models became in some weird sense, the reality rather than the reality trying to be the model. And so we ended up by all we cared about was validity. So the kind of reasoning that formalism gave us 
could only give us validity. And we didn't care that it didn't give us soundness because among the array of valid theories that we developed, we're going to test them unambiguously, supposedly, against this data with these new tools. So I'm going to sort out the mess. Mm -hmm. Well, the problem, of course, is that from the beginning, people should have known this from what's called the duham quine thesis, which is that the empirical tests, even in the natural sciences, let alone in the, in the human sciences, are not as unambiguous because we don't know when the data is opposite of what our prediction is from our theory that whether or not what got rejected was the network or one of the particular statements in it. So we don't know. The tests are not as unambiguous as we'd hope. So now our testing is, is not unambiguous and our theories are just valid, not sound. So that is kind of the, um, the context and some of the theoretical differentiations. Let's bring it to something concrete like the minimum wage. Yeah. So how, how does this approach to economics view something like the minimum wage? Is it an empirical question whether or not the minimum wage is going to cause unemployment, let's say? Well, so what you can say is that um, a rise in the minimum wage that is set above the market clearing wage, so that's a first clause that you have to have, so that that minimum wage is in fact binding, right? So if, to put it you know, easy, if, if uh, the market was paying $10 an hour uh, for workers already, and then you came along and said, no worker can get hired for less than $5 an hour, right? Uh, you know, that does, that's not binding. It's when workers are getting paid $5 an hour and then the government comes in and says, you have to pay them $10 an hour right. that you get this bite. Right. So that's the first thing we have to do. The second thing is, is that we have to recognize that it causes a disemployment effect, not an unemployment effect. Now, what do I mean by that? It, it, it's just a subtle distinction. What that means is that businesses can make all kinds of adjustments on the margins. So that are disemployment versus unemployment, meaning that they might not let workers off, like say, like, you're not working anymore. But what they might do is they might not pay benefits. They might not give college funds. Like think about McDonald's. When I was a kid, they used to have an employee of the month. And that employee of the month was then available for college scholarship. They don't do things like that anymore, right? Because we've raised the cost of, of, uh, of labor. And so you might see substitution. This is where, you know, now you start seeing more disappointment effects. Um, rather than having a cashier, I might end up by getting a computer that I do as a kiosk checkout. So I think that we can talk all about those disappointment effects and the multiple margins um, that are not, it's not an empirical question. When we talk about magnitudes of effects, those necessarily bring up mag you know empirical questions, but that's not empirical testing. That's empirical illustration and understanding how big is big. You know, so you know the minimum wage was eight fifty an hour, and now the government has made it nine dollars an hour. On the margin, we have a disemployment effect, but it's not as visible as if we had five dollars an hour the market wage and we raise the minimum wage to fifteen dollars an hour. Now we'd see a bigger disemployment effect. And again, it's not that the, the evidence is tested against the theory. It's that the theory is used to illustrate the phenomena of what happens when you cause labor to be more costly to hire, how capital will substitute for labor, all kinds of different adjustments are set in motion. And I think that that's how we reason as economists. And that theory um, that you're building, is that something, so for example, if we're talking about disemployment, is that you're saying this is logically necessary result in the real world? Well, yeah, I mean, again, you know, all economic laws are holding other things constant. Right. And so there could be all kinds of other things going on. It's sort of like if I take a feather and I throw it out to this, this uh, window, mm -hmm. it is true that that feather will fall according to the law of gravity. But a gust of wind may make it go up and down. And so I have to figure out, like, what are the alternative facts? So that's why economists always use the phrase holding other things constant. Right. And so I think that's important to keep in mind. But it's it's... If you are doing sound reasoning, not valid reasoning, and you do it correctly, what you are arguing is going to be what actually is in the world. So let's take the example of... Um, the and that's true. Just, just say that's true for, 
you know, minimum wages, but it's also true for, uh, you know, setting uh, price controls on rents, you know, rent, rent controls. You're going to see this kind of uh, consequences that result from that. Any kind of market uh, interference. So it, tax rates are going to have certain effect on, on, you know, behavior. So if I put a, a tax on cigarettes, right, it's going to affect, but the magnitude might not be as great because I'm looking at a good that might actually be relatively inelastic. So therefore it might take, uh, you know, uh, a huge increase in the tax to offset the behavior. Um, so I want to so, give yeah. one contrast. Yeah. So with the, with the feather falling to the ground, um, in that circumstance, we wouldn't say that it's a logical necessity that in all circumstances, when you drop a feather, it must go to the ground. The law of gravity is something that is contingent. It's not something yeah. that's logical. Now, isn't that different than what we're claiming? Sure, with because laws? the human sciences actually have an advantage over the natural sciences um, in this sense. And that is because we, ha we in the Misesian position, but I would argue this goes all the way back, is that we have what the ultimate cause is, which is that you know, human motivation, striving to better our position, basically substitute an unsatisfactory state of affairs for a, a more general satisfactory state of affairs. Now, you know, now, okay, so where economists get antsy about that kind of stuff in the modern kind of language is because, you know, Mises was a subjectivist. So one of the great advantages to Mises over earlier writers was that he didn't have all these different, he didn't worry so much about all these arguments in the utility function, right? That, you know, are you maximizing your money? Are you doing this? And he said, look, as a subjectivist, you just say people are striving to do the best that they can. This is what he meant by purposiveness, right? They're goal-oriented agents. They're going to ar arrange their means as best as they can to obtain the ends that they're seeking. But I'm not going to tell you which ends they should be seeking. And so as a result, Mises' logical structure of the purposive actor could apply across the board to a variety of different things, even like a religious zealot who, you know, burns himself at the stake or something like that, or follows superstition, um, or, you know, a money-grabbing, you know, capitalist, you know, uh, uh, sort of entrepreneur. And the logical structure of the, of the human action model or perspective, model's the wrong word, but is equally applicable to explaining that kind of behavior across the board or understanding. I mean, all of these terms have a lot of loaded epistemology to them, and most average conversations don't ref reflect that loaded epistemology, so I don't want to misstep here. I'm just, mm -hmm. I'm trying to talk in a very commonsensical yeah, way. Yeah. And so I would, if I was being philosophically attention, paying attention, I would say that what you know, what the Misesian position is, it's about understanding of, of human societies, human condition. It's not about explaining. This goes back. To, it's not about covering laws, right? It's, it's, you know, these are kind of things like you were talking about before. Those are physics. We are what we study. That gives us a sense in which we have the ultimate cause. So the old Jumian arguments about we don't know what the cause is of the billiard ball or whatever, we don't have to worry about because we know what the ultimate cause is. The ultimate cause is the purposiveness of individual economic actors. So could I rephrase, uh, rephrase it this way, that what is conceptually embedded in this idea of purposive action is if you unpack what we mean by humans act in mm -hmm. accordance with their preferences and they have that implies a logically tight theory for explaining economic phenomena right would you say that's a fair way of phrasing yeah it? so, so I, I the way i what i stress to you know audiences or whatever is that i think there's three different realms of economic knowledge one of them is pure theory this is what you and i have been talking about um, in pure theory, the, if the reasoning is correct, the propositions are necessarily true. Mm -hmm. Okay, but when then we have an issue called which we call applied theory, which is where we take our. But okay, so let me go back. The pure theory is necessarily true, but it's also very limited in some scope as opposed to from soup to nuts, right? And so I think where a lot of young people that are excited about Austrian economics make a mistake is they go from the pure theory to a very applied theory yes. without recognizing that they've stepped into a different realm. Yes. And so then they make these claims about the necessary truthness 
of this for looking out the window when we haven't really established that yet. But what we have established is that individuals are gonna arrange their means to obtain their ends as most effectively as they possibly can. Right. All right, and that they live in a world of uncertainty and so therefore it's all future oriented and all these kind of things like that. So I have this core theory. Then what I do is I put it in different institutional contexts. So what that does is it doesn't change the fact that individuals are rational. What it does is that rationality manifests itself in a variety of different situations and the details matter because that's where the context of the decision making takes place. So acting rationally within a private property system is different from acting rationally within an attenuated property system. Right. It's not that you're no longer acting rationally, it's just that you no longer can manifest your rationality the same way you would under this system. And so again, under the say let's take Austrian business cycle theory, you know, let's think about all the institutional specifics that are now being added to the picture. We have a monopoly supplier of the currency, mm -hmm. right? That's able to try to manipulate interest rates, right? And so we have a modern credit transmission mechanism, which with savings is becomes investment funds for others. Mm -hmm. So we're not talking about like the way in which banks were organized in the year 1300, right? Or we're not talking about sort of the way maybe uh, sort of uh, banks might have been organized in a, in, a, in a small community of pure barter or something. We're talking about in an industrial economy with a banking system where you have a financial intermediation in which savings of some become investment funds for others, that that's mediated through the interest rate. The interest rate creates a market for loanable funds. I, as an investor engaging in project, go and look at the interest rates as part of my cost of my engaging in my activity. And now, like, let's play out the story, right? And then all of a sudden, the Aust so the Austrian theory under those conditions with the idea that the government had significantly or systematically manipulated the money, the, the, the money and credit below the market clearing levels is going to lead to a boom and a bust cycle. Right. And so that's going to manifest itself in that world. Right. But if all of a sudden I started thinking about a world that was different than that, it would manifest itself in a different way. That's all I'm saying. Let me ask you a question specifically on that. Would you say, so, so what you said is, given the specific institutions that we find ourselves in, this boom and bust cycle is going to happen. Now, it, if, 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 you, if the government had pushed the interest rates below the right. market clearing rate, yeah. Is that conclusion, which is a statement about the world, though kind of in the abstract, is not saying this group is going to fail or this company is going to go bankrupt, is that conclusion that you state with confidence, is that something you're saying this is logically necessary? Because there's all these other yeah, yeah. variables. So in play. that's a great question. It's a it's a complicated question. So I think that again, if you go back to the earlier point about sound reasoning versus just validity, mm -hmm. is that if the various different premises, which I would include the details of empirical knowledge mm -hmm. that are in there, mm -hmm. are are in place and we don't make a mistake in our logical chain of reasoning that then it actually would be like a necessary outcome of that. But again, magnitudes push us in a different direction. So uh, once we start asking questions about magnitudes, we're really doing history. So we could say, for example, if some magnificent technology was created in the process of this boom and bust, we might actually, uh, the objective standard of living might still be going up, yes. although all this would be happening behind right. the scenes. So I use scene. this example all the time. It's a great point that you're raising because I think that describes the 20th century. Right. <laughs> is that, uh, that what we've had is, is um, so I, this is a colloquial, again, not yeah. philosophically serious, yeah. but I use this distinction between what I call a horse race between a, uh, the Smithian gains from trade so, so technically, if you think about this, I'm, I'm drawing with my hand now, but imagine that we have a total factor productivity curve and what can bump that total factor productivity curve up? Um, that is how much bang do we get for the buck that we invest in things? Mm -hmm. How you're gonna do that is you have increases in trade or you have increases in technology. That's gonna shift this thing up. Right. So now do against the, this trend line, do an oscillation of a boom and a bust. And so what you're going to see is you're going to see it's oscillating against a trend, then you're going to do it again at another trend. As long as trade and technology are increasing, tomorrow's trough is going to be higher than today's peak, even though we're still going through this mess of a boom and a bust cycle. I would say that's 1950 to 2009, basically, is what, what we've witnessed. So the way I tell this all the time is that imagine that you're doing a horse race between a horse named Smith and that represents the gains from trade. 
a horse named Schumpeter, and that represents the gains from innovation, technological innovation. And then a third horse, which is called stupidity. And that's, you government. know, government doing these stupid <laughs> policies. As long as the Smith and Schumpeter horse are ahead of the stupid horse, we still get better off. Yeah. But the reality is, is that there's been a lot of cases, Venezuela, the Soviet Union, you know, uh, Africa, where the stupid horse has curtailed the ability of the Schumpeter horse and the Smith horse to win out. Yeah. And so I think now what's wrong for people like you and I, how this becomes possible or difficult for us to reason is because we're reasoning in the counterfactual. Exactly. And that becomes really hard for us to convince other people that, the re that we got the EPA and we still grew. And so therefore the untrained mind says, oh, EPA, therefore we grew rather than EPA in spite, you know, kind of thing. And so this is the old Bastiat point about what is seen as what is unseen. And the untrained mind always looks at what is seen. They see EPA growth. And we're like, no, the, the, uh, you know, that, that, that made it worse off. We could have been that much better. Right. And by the way, we actually probably could have gotten better environmental quality right. had we just experienced real economic growth and the technological gains. Because one of the great advantages of technological improvement is that you take what previously was waste and you turn it into productivity. Right. So you don't need government to tell you that, right? And so, but, you know, that argument is so hard for us to communicate, especially to a generation that believes that science equals measurement, right? right? And so we have an uphill battle to fight, um, and we just have to keep taking different bites of the apple when we're fighting it. Yeah. I really like the analogy with the, uh, the horse race, and in my mind, I was thinking it's kind of like the horses are facing opposite directions and they're tied to each other. Yeah. So like in the Soviet Union, you had the incompetence that was outweighing the progress. Right. And yeah. then maybe in the United yeah, States. Yeah, I'm going to borrow that from you. Yeah. I use, I say that the horse, the stupid horse can be nasty. So it's biting at the, yeah. the heels and the ears of the other horses. Yeah. And sometimes they stop running because they're dead. You know, but I think that, that you're right, that what's happening is whether or not the horse moves in the opposite direction. Yeah. By the way, in our current context, I think this is what people are confusing with the great stagnation thesis. Exactly. I think what's happened is that the government horse has gotten so stupid and so constraining of our gains from trade and our gains from innovation that what appears to be a stagnation because they claim the rate of technolo technology is slowed, that's not possible. Like you were talking about on your trip, you know, the human imagination is the greatest resource. It's, we haven't seen the beginning of what the influence of nanotechnologies are or anything like that. But what we've done is we've made it so costly for people to innovate these things into the market that what you're seeing is the rate of innovation is being slowed because of the government regulations. And so the stupid horse is biting. So we're still getting better t tomorrow than we are today, but not at the same way that we were, say, between the period of 1955 you know, and 1980 or something like that, and, uh, or between 1980 and 2000, if you just think about these things. Like what exactly. happens, cell phones, I'm holding a cell phone up. You know, like uh, I always kid around with my, with my students and I use the example of Dallas. And, you know, they don't even know what Dallas is anymore, the TV show, the old TV show. And I say, you know, Victoria Principal got killed on Dallas, right? And it turned out she didn't get killed, but she was in a contract dispute. So they killed her off on the show. And the way they killed her off was she was talking on her cell phone. But... So she's the richest woman in the world and her cell phone was the size of this like notebook, right? And so of course she smashes the car. Now you sit in a classroom and the kids have, every kid has a cell phone that's wired and you know, it's amazing. But that used to be only for the very, very wealthy. Right. Now it's widely available to everyone. That's amazing technological progress. We should expect to see that. And you know, going back to your point about macro and stuff, in a world that has had that kind of technological innovation, the fact that we haven't actually had a decline in the price level should suggest that we've actually been experiencing a lot more inflation than what we officially count. Right. Because in a world where technology is constantly improving, we should actually see the real cost of goods going down, yes. not staying the same or going slightly up. And that is very important for understanding the measuring of the Greenspan Fed which was an inflationary m manipulation of money and credit and which caused then the current crisis that we had. But people look at it and they're like, oh, but, you know, that's not the inflation rates like we saw in the 70s. And it's like, but yes, actually it was. Greenspan put 
is that he deviated from the sort of general rules about where interest rates should be. They pushed the interest rates down, they stimulated, and they all got sent in a certain direction because of another set of public policies. So this goes back again to the empirical point. Yes. I can tell you that there's going to be a boom and bust, but the particular manifestation of the boom and bust is going to be a function of a lot of institutional details. That's what I yeah. want to focus on. So let's take this... I really want to do want to focus on the empirics versus the theory. Let's take this back with the minimum wage. Would you say the question of the minimum wage in the real world is one of applied economics, or is this still in the realm of pure choice, the logic of choice? So understanding the disemployment effect yeah. is an issue of pure theory. Yeah. Understanding the particular manifestations of the disemployment effect is a matter of applied economics, which is more of an art. So I, so let me go back to my thing. So I have pure theory, yeah. I have applied theory, and then I have history. Yeah. History is all the things that people talk about, which could be public policy economics. It could be empirical, like testing, whatever they call it. They don't test it, but like it's useful to sometimes know what the correlation is, you know, between, you know, trade policy and growth of a country or something like that. But that's not testing the theory, either the applied or the pure. What it is, is it's just history, which is guided by these two other theory kind of ideas. Right. So, but I think it's a legitimate realm of human scientific inquiry, which is history, empirical Would information. You call it something like a study of the, the magnitudes, right? yeah. in, in a sense. Yeah, but the reality, so, yeah. so you have the, the sort of the pure logic of choice and that gives you the basic scaffolding, right? So, or, you know, one economist described this as a difference between the skeleton and then all of the things like, you know, putting the muscles and the veins and everything else and then eventually the skin, right? And so the way I think about it is, is that, um, so it's again, another kind of very commonsensical thing. So do you remember in Harry Potter, when Harry Potter, uh, you know, uh, broke his arm when he was playing, yeah, you know, yeah. and the, then the, the one wizard comes over and he says, I'll fix your arm. And then all of a sudden he takes the bones out and Harry's arm just flops around like this. This is what happens to people that don't have economic theory. <laughs> they just flop around. And so you have to have the bones. That's done in the pure theory. Right. Then what the applied theory is, is it adds some other things in there, which is like maybe the circulation system of the human body and things like that. Yes. And then you get history and then you start getting more you know, empirical knowledge about your makeup, right? Or, you know, whatever. And so it's that kind of move from the pure bones. But what you can't do is you can't do here without having the bone structure. So, that, and so that's, yeah. that's the area I want to focus on because you're right. I think a lot of confusion in Austrian, self-described Austrian economic circles is, is conflating these categories. So I yeah. want to kind of take a more devil's advocate position about the logic, uh, th this area of pure logic. So let's say that we can logically conclude that there's going to be some disemployment effect from the minimum wage. You would agree with that. What if I were to say there are, in the real world, in all circumstances, when you have something like the minimum wage, you raise the cost of employment, it's the only thing that's changing is never just the cost of employment. There's also people's beliefs change. So mm -hmm. somebody might make the case to say, oh, well, in fact, I've seen people say this. They say, well, when somebody gets the minimum wage, they have a raise, a raise in the minimum wage, they get paid more, they start being more productive because they're more, they feel like they're a more competent worker, and therefore that offsets mm -hmm. all these things. How would you respond to that? Well, okay, so a couple things about that. Um, one, that reverses the causation between wages and, and work effort. So this is what they, in, in economics, it's called what if price influence quality. Right. Rather than quality being the factor that influences right. price. So they try to flip the causation arrow. Right. So for those of us who work within sort of more standard, older economics, what Henry Hazlitt used to call orthodox economics, we see wages as a function of the marginal productivity of the workers, not the marginal productivity being a function of the wages. Is that a, a connection that you're claiming is logically? Yes. <laughs> okay. okay. I would, I would okay. argue that. Right. I might be on some sketchy ground with that, but I actually think n n not so much um, because it's an issue of how is that, where do these wages come from? Right. And you have to recognize that wages are simply a price for a scarce resource that we get through exchange ratios in the market. And just because I pay um, 
you know, a hundred dollars, let's say for this pen, let's say that you say to me, Hey, I'm going to sell you this pencil for a hundred dollars. And I pay uh, that hundred dollars for the pen, that, uh, that pencil, it doesn't mean that that pencil necessarily, you know, is now going to be a hundred dollar pencil. It's that I might have made an error in my estimation of the marginal value of this pencil. Certain times, of course, you know, this is where it gets complicated. Certain times this pencil might be worth $100. Let's say I had to sign a document and I don't have anything around and you're like holding it there and I need it and I can't, like I got to sign in blood or sign with yeah. a pencil. And you say, look, I'll give you this pencil for $100. Like, yeah. gladly, right? Yeah. So I'm just, and again, the pencil doesn't have any objective properties, but but the idea that what we what this is calling is that the pencil will endogenously react to the price that we pay for it, I think is different from the idea that the reason why I'm willing to pay for this pencil a certain price is because you're willing to pay for that pencil for another price. And that's competition. You know, we do not compete with labor doesn't compete with management. Labor competes with labor. Right. And so labor is trying to compete with labor to get that job. And so management is trying to bid among the labor. And it's in that negotiation price that. So now let's go back to, you know, this story. If I am going to produce for that firm only three dollars an hour, if the if the if the boss decides to pay me five dollars an hour, he's losing two dollars every hour. He would like to bid me down to a penny an hour, right? But the reason why I don't take a penny an hour is because I can go across the street and make a dollar an hour. And then if I don't kind of do a dollar an hour, I'm going to go here, right? And so it's this interaction between the, the bids and the ass that are going to end up by determining. And so that's why the price formation process is connected to this marginal productivity theory of wages. But that sounds, I mean, very compelling, but... It seems like it's a logical possibility to imagine a scenario where somebody gets a raise entirely as a function of the minimum wage, yeah. and they think, "Wow, I'm a more valuable employee." And then that changes, even not maybe not explicitly, but it implicitly changes. There's so a, a lot, psychological benefit. So a lot of people claim that Henry Ford uh, overpaid his workers in what they call an efficiency wage. This is what this argument is. And that Henry Ford wanted to make sure he cut down on turnover and other kinds of issues. So he paid his employees more than what they could get alternatively. And as a result, he had a more productive workforce. Mm -hmm. But, you know, that that strategy actually is part of what constitutes the marginal productivity of the workers. So this is what I so that is a market response. So the problem with the minimum wage is that what if I mean, what if they priced it? the wrong way, right? So let's go back to what you're talking about, logical conditions. It's, I would argue that logically I can do a strategy, right? Which will say to me that I can offer a higher wage than is currently being offered, but I can, I'm going to be constrained by the marginal productivity of what the new higher wage will give us. Yeah, but you don't know what that is beforehand. Uh, no market. Per- There's a difference between market predictions and theoretical positions, right? Mm-hmm. So if I if I argue that so in the Henry Ford story, mm-hmm. I engage in these efficiency wages. Well, really, are they efficiency wages? Because what's happened is because I've now created a more loyal workforce, I now actually have a higher wage. I have higher productivity. Right. Therefore, justifying the wage. I'm still. Right. That's what enables. I'm not cutting into my. I'm not raising my cost. The minimum wage set by the government is a raising of the cost. And the reason why I would argue that the kind of argument that you're running, that you say people come up with, isn't going to work is because we don't actually know how to adjust that if the government has put a cap. So, so if Henry Ford is wrong, or right, he's going to be suffer a penalty in the market, right. and he's going to have to adjust. But if the minimum wage is wrong, there's no adjustment process being made. But couldn't we say that it's a, it is a possibility that you could, might say the minimum wage is right? It's ridiculous to think that they could just say, oh, this is what, at this particular price point, you're going to get the additional um, productivity from the worker. Isn't that a, a logical possibility? In order to get the result that you're talking about, it would have to be in the range between uh, what the market would bear. Right. Rather than the idea. Right. Rather than the idea that it's a 
like above the market binding price. So if you think about Von Bavrik's, the way he does economics, right? He's gonna have these stair step demand curves, okay? And then you're gonna have like a stock curve, right? So the number of workers, mm -hmm. all right? So this is different from a normal sort of discrete, this is discrete unit mm -hmm. rather than the continuous mm -hmm. thing. And so what you're gonna have here is in price formation, you're always gonna have like a range. And so I think in markets, we have a range we don't necessarily have necessarily X marks the spot. Okay. And what you're picking up is in that is in that range of negotiations. But if you tried to set this wage above that, then you would end up by getting the disemployment effects. So me... But if you're in here, let's say that I'm originally asking here and you're saying, oh, I'm going to be an entrepreneurial you know, employer yes. and I'm going to pay you here and I'm going to get more out of you. I think as long as it's in that range, what it does is it's going to bid that that price of labor up, right, to get the more productive labor. But if I go above what the market could bear, then I'm going to get these disappointment okay, effects. Okay, that's a good point. But because they can't see that graph you, you drew, let me, <laughs> I'm going to rephrase that and see if you think this is a fair way to rephrase it. What you're saying is that the logic, the pure theoretical logical argument about why the minimum wage causes disappointment has to do with raising the minimum wage above market clearing price. And it is conceivable that the minimum wage would be raised to a point that is still within market clearing price and yeah. therefore you don't see the employment effects. Now, if that's the case, that, and that, and that makes sense based on preserving the logic of all this, couldn't somebody then say, well, where that point is, uh, where the market clearing price is just an empirical phenomenon, so the minimum wage, you can have an airtight argument for raising the minimum wage to $20 an hour because that's going to raise people's productivity okay, to a certain so degree. Okay, so I think that what pure theory allows us to do is set these boundaries, yeah. which is that workers will not take jobs below their opportunity costs. So, right? And they won't and and employers won't hire people above their marginal revenue product. Yes, but couldn't could And any any decision hold on, and any decision outside of that bounds yes. is going to end up by having uh, you know, consequences which will lead to a weeding out Right, so you won't be able to hire me anymore because you won't have any money in your bank, and, and you know because you're making losses on every single transaction. Or I am not going to be. I'm going to be passing on opportunities at every every pass. Right. But isn't that kind of an, an admission then that like it almost seems like you've though I agree with what you're saying yeah. you're you've marginalized uh, the impactfulness of economic theory because somebody could say well technically it's true but we may live in a world where government should raise it raise the minimum wage at twenty dollars an hour because we might be still within those boundaries yeah so i think that okay so that it, I, I i take your challenge i think again go back to the harry potter thing without those bones that establish that we end up by having this which is what i think I is going on in the debate but the actual manifestation is a magnitude question. Right. And I do think that that is actually something we should pay attention to. Right. So if you go back to the, the original Card and Kruger study where they're looking at New Jersey and they're looking at Pennsylvania, I was teaching in New York at that time. McDonald's in New York City was already paying like $8 an hour minimum wage. And, you know, they were talking about a move from a $6 to a whatever. So, you know, what are the different conditions? And, and again, you know, they looked just merely at number of employees let go. And it turned out, by the way, that one of the questions you had to ask was how many hours was they working? So whether or not, so, you know, they pass a minimum wage, but they didn't cut back the number of workers, but they cut back the number of hours. This is like this guy, Newmark, you know, went and redid the studies right away. Now, what's the status of that going back to our early epistemological questions? I don't think it affected the theory of the labor market, but I do think it affects the way we talk about public policy and the manifestations. So we're over here in history. Mm -hmm. What we're not doing is showing that the theory of economics is wrong. We're showing particular illustrations. And so I would just, mm -hmm. so you, you, you keep asking me about whether or not this affects the logical status of the laws. Maybe I'm too blinded and too much of an economist in my own ways or whatever. I don't see it as affecting the laws of economics. I see it as affecting the discussion that we would have about the illustration of the laws and public policy relevance. So this is where I'm going with, the, the, because I think this, 
is the error that a lot of people in who might ideologically agree with us. I think yeah. this is the error, specific error that they make. Um, it seems like this is opening the door, at least theoretically, to a central planner's argument. So a lot of people take the claims of Mises, for example, and they say it is logically impossible to have socialism for these reasons because you don't get meaningful prices. Right. If we're saying, well, it's possible, but it's ridiculous given the uh, given empirical constraints, isn't isn't that important? So so for example, what if I were to say, what if I had the hubris to say, well, I am the central planner who knows where these ranges are, and and for the sake of the economy, I want to set the minimum wage at X level because that I know is going to result in a higher level of productivity and higher wages for everybody. All right. So what I would say on that is that, you know, Mises' statement is actually a fairly uh, straightforward, you know, argument. Without private property and the means of production, there's no market for the means of production. Without market and means of production, there's no prices set, no exchange ratios established, no monetary prices. Without monetary prices, you can't engage in economic calculation. You, you don't know whether or not to invest in Project A or Project B. And, I, and the example I give to students all the time trying to get them to really hone on this is I say, write down a present value calculation. You've learned the formula in finance and everything like that. Write it down. And now think about all the things that have to be true in order for you to engage in that calculation, you know, to be able to determine whether or not I should take a lump sum. If I, you win the lottery tomorrow, should you take a lump sum or should you take the annuity driving out? How am I going to make that calculation? Well, you need to know about property. You need to know about security of property. You need to know about inflation rates, yep. sound money, all kinds of things like that, right? So this is what Mises is highlighting on. And what he says is that without economic calculation, socialist economy is impossible. Meaning that the socialist economic system cannot allocate resources rationally from the point of view of um, the, the allocation of scarce resources among competing ends. So economic calculation does the following thing. It sorts out from the array of technologically feasible projects those which are economically viable. So like you got here today and you said you were driving the, the moving truck. You know, you could have gone here by a helicopter. You could have gone here by a, uh, like a bicycle. There's all kinds of different ways that you could have got here that were technologically feasible. But hopefully, you know, you picked the one, especially given that you have this budget and you're trying to figure everything out, you picked the one that was most economically viable to do it. How did you figure that out? Well, you had to have an array of prices. You have a budget constraint. You figure all this out. So think about that, right? This is what Mises is talking about. But what Mises didn't say is that socialism would then just sort of grind to a complete like halt and do nothing. So they would allocate resources based on what? Political power. Like, so who are my friends? I'm going to reward my friends and punish my enemies. Well, you know, that generates one kind of system. Um, I'm just going to make everything be a technological problem. So that's why Ingsoc in Orwell is always at war with either, you know, um, uh, you know, Eurasia or whatever the different, you know, other socialist countries that he's fighting with, right? Um, and so they're always going to be at war because I substitute the economic problem for a technological problem and I can appear to think like I solved the planner's problem. But I didn't really solve a planner's problem from the point of view of rationalization of production. I just allowed the planner to do something, which right. is to exercise their political control over, over the economic means in society. Now, Okay, so, but Mises' point, which is brilliant, I actually think it's the most, the single most important contribution of 20th century economics is Mises' 1920 article. Um, in my own opinion, that's, you know, that's the greatest contribution. Not Hayek's use of knowledge, Hayek's knowledge, use of knowledge argument, a very important argument, but it's a derivative of Mises' main argument. Um, and, um, and so, you know, that's where I would put the beginning of all of this stuff. I think it's important to recognize that like a country that claims to be socialist but still has private property doesn't say face the same economic calculation problem. It faces other problems, which our Mises talks about as well, which is on an, an, an a hampered economy and what happens in an hampered economy. But it doesn't face a thing where they've abolished the exchange ratios right. for goods, for capital goods, which is the key issue. And so like Mises, you know, that people always ask Mises, like, what would be examples of, you know, where would be an extreme socialism? What would happen? You know, what would be the kind of things that would be missing? 
you know, one of them be the absence of a stock market, you know, uh, the absence for any market and capital goods, right? And, and so the real socialist, the market socialist model was somehow that I don't need a market for capital goods, but I can have a market for consumer goods. That's what the market socialist thought. And then I can, through ipso facto, get the market, the price for the capital goods. And Mises and Hayek, this is where Hayek comes in, because this is who he's arguing with even more than Mises is. They're like, hey, wait a minute. You can't do that unless you're in equilibrium conditions, right? So I can infer the price of a capital good from the consumer good price in equilibrium. But outside of equilibrium, I have to discover you know, that price anew every day. I don't know what the least cost technologies are. So how am I ever going to come up with that? And the answer always was by assumption, right? But, you know, if I have full and complete information of all technological possibilities and blah, blah, blah. And so this is what was going on in the models. So in the real world, I look out the window. The question is, is, hmm, you know, like I look out there all the time and there's like all kinds of government set prices for stuff, right? And does that mean that they are... Um, unable to act? No, because remember the issue is not that they act, but that they act, right? Socialist economy is impossible. That is, are we allocating these roads? You know, we price these roads right outside of here. We're doing a big project right now on the road that when you came in, and the reason is, is because they found a, a civil war road in their digging. So now they're trying to go around and do all of that. There's a ton of workers out there. They're all going in different directions. They're doing something. But are they doing it in a economically rational way or an economically wasteful way? I think that we have good reasons to argue that they're doing it in an economically, you know, inefficient way. Though they're doing it. And, they're, and right. how, how come this company got the contract and not that company? And that opens up all the stuff having to do with political allocation versus economic allocation. Do you think... Um in terms of people who would claim that they have some economic understanding of the world, I would be one of them. I would say, yeah, I understand. Uh, through the lens of like the economic way of thinking, I understand, I think, uh, on a large degree, how the world works, yeah. how politics and all that. Do you think that in order to make such a claim, you have to have this uh, applied economic understanding, or can you just... Be, you can can you just study just the logic of act, uh, the logic of human action just get that economic theory um, you know you sit in an armchair yeah. and you deduce this so so I think yeah. think about Henry Hazlitt yeah okay so Henry Hazlitt wrote that book in 1946 47 published in 47 uh, it was a New York Times bestseller an amazing book and it's still like around we still read it and, but all of his examples are older examples or whatever but it just takes us as a reader to sort of say oh yeah the book still comes alive and everything like that but that's a book in applied economics and public policy right. and he doesn't really spend all that much time on the pure bones right of it but the pure bones couldn't if they weren't there then you wouldn't have the oomph of the other stuff right. so i think for most people if you get the if you understand the pure bones you move really quickly yes. to this issue of simply trying to understand the world out the window rather than the world on a blackboard and that a lot of the debates within pure economics and in applied economics that are the esoteric properties of academic guild right are kind of irrelevant for you know the average joe trying to figure out you know things and that the average joe trying to figure things out actually might have superior knowledge to the the academic who's trapped in the guild and trying to make nuanced arguments about this this or this it's like a it becomes like a pure intellectual game. So, you know, again, you know, you can't see this here, but like I get, uh, one of the things I think about in my head is that if you study um, all the great thinkers in economics, so imagine you have a picture of a globe and then you study Adam Smith and Karl Marx and, you know, John Baptiste Say and John Maynard Keynes and, you know, all the different thinkers, Malthus, whatever. The key issue is that you should study their theories from them to the way they understood the world. So you see an arrow going from them to the world. But when you get into modern economics, what you do is you just study the different theories, right? And so you miss the world. You end up by, you know, so you understand Marx versus, you know, uh, Smith versus Say versus Malthus versus Ricardo or whoever. But what you don't do is you don't engage the world. And so you end up 
in this kind of circle jerk around the edge of understanding the world. And what we need to do is force people to gain, engage once again back with the world rather than just around. The only reason why I want to know about the difference between Marx and Smith is because I want to know what that means for the seeing the world, not just having, but academics has a lot of incentive systems for us just to tweak around on the edges of these, these out here without ever engaging in the world. And I think this is, um, I've always really liked this, this phraseology from Ayn Rand, though I don't take Ayn Rand's position on things, but she liked to say that you get caught between uh, free-floating abstractions and momentary concreteness. Right. And I think that that actually is what the biggest problem of modern economics is, is that we get caught in these pure theoretical debates, not the kind of theories that you and I were talking about, but these purely valid models that we are free-floating abstractions. Right. And then we do these momentary concretes, which are like, you know, too detailed without any, without the bones in them, right? right. And that, that's the, the two evils, right? It's what I call formalistic historicism, right? So it, it's like you have a formal model that proves any goddamn thing in the world and you, you know, go out there in the world and then there's no like overall any principles about what's going on. Right. And so what we want to do is we want to avoid those two things and finding out those set of thinkers that fall within that gap, that avoid free-floating abstractions and momentary concreteness, that's who you're going to find as like the useful social thinkers. So you mentioned economics. In some sense, you know, if you take the true Misesian position, economics is just one developed branch of a more general science of basically what you would call social theory or what Mises calls praxeology, which is a study of human action in all our walks of life. And... So that praxeological discipline avoids, I would argue, free-floating abstractions and momentary concreteness. Yes, I find that, um, kind, of, kind of as an aside, I, I, I find that, you've, that distinction between the free-floating abstractions and the concretes is not just in economics, it's in every field of thought. Yeah. Most, most profoundly in my own research is in mathematics, where yeah. they've intentionally divide, cut themselves off. We say, we, well, our conclusions do not apply to the real world. Right, it's at all. Stick. Exactly, yeah, yeah. like yeah. explicitly, which I think is preposterous. But you, you also said, I want to highlight one thing that you said, that when you focus on the logic, the other stuff goes very quickly. So going back to your minimum wage, you look at there and you say, oh yeah, these workers got you know a higher wage now. Well, but what are the consequences that as a result of that? What are these secondary consequences? And then you start talking about disemployment and all these other kind of things like that. Rent controls. I establish a rent control, but then 20 years from then, I have a, a like a slung. Like, how did that happen? I, 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 I you know, I, I made sure that the least advantaged society were supposed to be taken care of by lowering the rent. Well, then, you know, what happened to maintenance of those apartments? You know, the supply of the apartments, all that kind of stuff like that changes. And so I think that if we can get students to think in terms of the pure logic and then, you know, see the nuances that are associated with putting more and more flesh on the thing and then the actual real world examples in policy, but always guided by that. And if you don't have those bones, you're going to end up by being Harry Potter without an arm. Yeah, and, that, and that, that's really what I'm glad we got to focus on was that relationship between the theory and the data um, because... We, as you well know, we live in an intellectual culture that not only overlooks theory, dismisses it. That oh, is, that the whole big data exactly. no movement it's, is crazy. I think it's yeah. completely backwards. I had a guy the other day that was accusing me, I was accusing my philosophy. He said, man, you're stuck in the 19th century, or the 20th century. As an insult, I said, no, I'm stuck in the 19th century. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I, yeah. Because that, that, they, the rationalist method of let's get our concepts sorted and in order, yeah. and then we'll go out and try to right. interpret what's going on. I think that's incredibly important. Yeah, so I, I, I think that's a fair statement about, you know, what's going on. I think that when we engage in debates with people that affect real world topics, minimum wage, rent controls, trade restrictions, um, Cuba, Venezuela, you know, these kind of things, right? Um, that there is a kind of important issue of having to see certain conceptual clarity. And part of that conceptual clarity is definitions. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people don't see disemployment unless they see workers no longer working. <laughs> And the reality might be is that the conditions under which the workers are working have changed. So this is very important to recognize that in the real world, 
that employers may in fact make adjustments on multiple margins. And we need to be pay attention to all these multiple margins that employers are working on to see the disemployment effects. So what I'm saying there is that conceptual clarity allows us to actually see things that lack of conceptual clarity won't let us see. And so that's why I like to use the metaphor of eyeglasses. Can we that, push it even yeah. further? Can we say that conceptual clarity allows you to conceptually understand what you cannot see? Yeah, well, that's yeah, yeah that's the unseen, the right. seen and the unseen. But like the reason why I like the metaphor of the glasses is one, uh, I have found in, in my teaching career uh, that the commonsensical notion that you need eyeglasses to be able to read doesn't cause the same thing as if I spent like 30 minutes talking to them about the pure logic of choice. I just sort of say, okay, look, you know, I right now, this is how I start. I can't see very far. And I say, you know, you guys, this is principles, right? You kids in the back of the row, I can't really form like your, I know that you're, there's a, there's data out there, but I can't really form like what you look like, you know, what you're, who you are or anything like that. I put on these glasses and now all of a sudden you're in sharp relief. You're brought into sharp relief. This is what economics does for us. Right. Economics is this set of eyeglasses. And by that, I mean, basically the whole Misesian and logic of choice kind of position. This is a set of eyeglasses. And once I put it on, I'm now able to see you back there without this on all I know is there's a buzz. So in some sense, without theory, there is a bunch of data, but I can't make any sense out of it. Theory allows me to then interpret that data and make sense of it. That's a very, very commonsensical effort to try to get at a very deep philosophical issue. You've been asking me about the deeper philosophical issue. I agree with you um, that those issues are important, that we need to be working on those and that we need to get and continually refine and improve our arguments with those against others. You asked me the question about talking to others in our intellectual culture in general, and I wonder if our intellectual culture in general is more ready to accept the eyeglasses right. than the deeper philosophical position. Yeah. But the question I think that you're right on, this is something that like Rand also stressed and everything like that, which is that at some level, it's always going to come back to those fundamental philosophical issues. Right. I think it's a wonderful note to end on. I want yeah. to thank you again very oh, much for sitting down and I, talking I, with me. I uh, wish you the best on your trip and uh, can't wait to hear uh, you when you get back about all the adventures that you've had and the things that you've learned. And, uh, you know, uh, keep in mind that uh, sometimes the best teacher of philosophy and economics is life. And, you know, and uh, you can learn a hell of a lot, you know, besides the books. Uh, and uh, but it will help form the books and uh, look forward to, to reading your books in the future. Thank you. All right. So that was my conversation with Dr. Pete Betke of George Mason University. We talked a lot about Ludwig von Mises. And if you guys aren't familiar with uh, this thinker, I suggest Googling him and learning about him because, at least in my circumstance, he was one of the reasons I actually got drawn into philosophy and in epistemology and the study of logic, which for me is now kind of my the, the central area of my own research. If you're ambitious and you want to take on a, a big book, then uh, his seminal work is called Human Action. I'll have a link to that in the show notes page which is steve-patterson.com slash 13. And if you make it all the way through the book, I can pretty much guarantee it will be impossible for it not to change your worldview in some meaningful way. All right, so that's all for this episode. I hope you guys have a fantastic day.